Christians fall apart. This is the start of a poem written just over a hundred years ago by W.B. Yeats called The Second Coming. And it starts, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. He wrote it just after the terrible First World War of carnage and stupidity and towards the end of a terrible world epidemic of influenza. But that feeling of things falling apart is what I think many young people particularly feel nowadays. The centre does not hold and I want to just explain a few of the features that lie behind that feeling. Various crises, tipping points and so on. One is obviously population and resources. When I was born the world had only two and a half billion people in it. Now it has over three times that number and they press on all the resources as we know combined with the effects of the industrial pollution, it is leading to a crisis of unparalleled dimensions, the destruction of our environment. Every day we turn on our televisions or whatever and we see the fires and the floods and the famines and the ice melting and the oceans polluted. And it's a terrible story and no one seems to be doing very much about it. Governments do not seem capable uh, of putting away their own selfish gains to coordinate, to deal with the largest problem facing humanity. That's the first problem. The second is disease. Uh, talking at the end of the COVID epidemic, this has loomed large, that we are now prone to many more pandemics because of our infiltration into the natural world, experimentation, um, going into remote areas and jungles. And so we are faced with real problems of disease, compounded by the fact that many of our traditional medicines, antibiotics and so on, are losing their efficacy and anti-malarials. On the other hand, the, a, the disease revolution has changed our whole demography, particularly in the West, so that people are, like me, are living and active much longer. Another 20, 30 years has been gained during my lifetime. And this means that up to a third of the human population soon will be retired. And that brings many other difficulties, if not crises, in the future, as well as the very old, the fourth age. So those are some problems, and those are Malthusian problems, as is war. I think, I thought, many thought, that after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, war could be put away. There had been centuries of terrible war, but now was the end of history. The West had won war was over. But, of course, you soon had um, wars within Europe, and certainly you had the Iraq invasion, Afghanistan, Syria, and so on. And so war rides again, and as I speak, the Ukrainian war is going on. So we seem to have learnt nothing and been unable to control war. And that leads to a final Malthusian crisis, which is famine. Again, after the awful famines that um, occurred in the 20th century in Russia, in China, in India, it looked towards the end of that century as if famine could at last be contained by new crops and new irrigation and new wealth. But now, even as I speak, we hear about potential famines in Yemen, 
in Afghanistan, in North Africa, not just potential, but starting. And millions will starve and die unless something changes. That uh, famine and um, malnutrition and poverty leads to another tipping point, which is in refugees. As the South heats up and the poverty increases, then people in the southern half of the hemisphere are migrating, using their feet to try and save their lives. So both from South America northwards and from Africa northwards. Um, at the moment, a fairly large trickle, but it's very likely that within a few years, there will be millions and millions trying to escape to slightly cooler and more prosperous areas. There are deeper political problems as well. Another thing that I had assumed was that with the end of history and the defeat of the Soviet Union, democracy was assured. Our system of government was the best and that gradually all countries, including China and everywhere else, would become democratic in our Western sense. That reassurance and assurance has vanished just in a matter of a few years. The various reasons for that. One is obviously Donald Trump in the way he almost destroyed and may return to destroy American democracy. And then we have seen increasingly, as we watch the history of India and um, sectarianism, as we watch what's happening in all sorts of parts of the world, we can see that democracy doesn't suit everybody at all. And it is a flawed system, even within, as we discovered when we all marched and voted against the Iraq war. It's flawed even within our uh, centers of democracy. So we question that. Um, and that is also part of a big shift that is affecting all of us, which is a shift in world power, international power. The rise of the East, as it were, and particularly China, as well as India and other parts of the world, has not decided our reassurance and assurance that Western civilization is right at the top and everyone will gradually move towards us. The relative power of Europe is declining very fast and of my country as it is of America. And so we are challenged with models, political, economic, social, ideological models, which we could dismiss when the country is concerned were weak and vulnerable, but now are a real challenge to our assumptions. Um, that is part of something uh, that is affecting us all, of course, and another aspect of it, and that is globalization. Even 20, 30 years ago, the world was far less connected, connected through economic chains, supply chains, and interdependency, and above all, connected by the internet and global communications. We are all just one press of a button away from knowing things about all sorts of parts of the world. And the world feels very small. The whole world now feels what Cambridge, for example, felt like when I um, first came to it. I could know most parts of it roughly. And now the world is as small as a town. And that's led also to another feature, which is multiculturalism. Again, when I was a child, a boy at university, England was, and Britain was, white. It had had an empire which had enormously influenced us, but I hardly ever met anyone from another culture, another civilization, perhaps from Europe, but that was it. But in the last, just in the last 10 or 15 years, that has changed even in remote Finland villages in England. You now see many Africans, Indians, Chinese and others. And that multiculturalism is destabilizing for many people who have never faced meeting people from other cultures of that kind. All of this goes down to a deeper level, which is that of identity, our identities. 
because we knew who we were and we knew the world around us, we thought. And now it, our identities are challenged at every level. One great theme of this is equality, the growing equalization and leveling of our civilization means that our identity in every respect, the differences are being blurred. So, for example, between males and females, the rise of the power of women, the transgender movements, all these mean that as a man and as a woman, we now have to consider and think about our identities in a way that was not thought about when I was younger. The same with race. Um, the easy assumptions of racial differences are being challenged by Black Lives Matter and so on. So that's uh, another huge change. Likewise, any kind of class or um, other hierarchy so that the class is emerging and the challenge is to all kinds of authority. Why should we listen to you, you old Cambridge professor? Um, how, how is it that you think you know more than I do? So all sense, all uh, types of authority, specialized knowledge is being challenged. And that leads into an even wider problem, which is about truth and fact. We're told we live in a post-truth generation. And that means that basically every statement is now being challenged. How do we know that is true? I've heard the opposite and so on. Everyone is their own specialist and you cannot accept for fact anything, all sorts of lies and deceits, fake news and so on and so on. And when the president of the ex-president of the United States is always talking about the, the media and the scientists and the academics being peddling fake news, then who are we to believe? Who are we to trust? Trust is lost and a belief in absolute truth is lost. Um, so what has happened is that the fixed assumed good things, democracy, um, wealth, uh, escape from famine, all these fixed good things that I'd assumed even 15, 20 years ago are challenged and seem to be up for grabs. We are at a tipping point, as I mentioned, and this is really confusing. I get emails from people all over the world, people saying, what are we to believe? What are we to do? Everything seems to be in flux and we seem to be on turbulent tides being hurled around like little corks in an ocean. But to them, I reply, well, actually, that is all true, but it's not the first time. As I quoted Yeats, people have felt this again and again through history. And there are solutions to all these problems. And the way to find these solutions is to call, to look at the causes of all the things I've mentioned and others, analyze them, and then to come up with a solution. And very often the solution is quite simple and easy and already known and could be delivered if governments had the willpower and the backing of people to do them. So as a historian and anthropologist looking at the wide history of the world and across the countries, I have hope and I believe that we can deal with all these things sensibly and escape from this apparent chaos. And that is the theme of many of the talks, conversations I had with a philosopher, Richard Marshall, and which are being included in our book, Understandings of the Modern World, which we hoped to publish soon. So this is, in a way, a preface to explain what are the questions behind that book, which were reflections on Zoom during COVID about the state of the world as I saw it after a lifetime 
of many decades. So do not lose hope. We have hope. We can change the world. But we first need to understand it. Thank you.